the opportunity for not just the average consumer, not just for the investor, but for you, the real estate agent, to better understand what is this trend? How is it working? And how can you benefit by knowing all about it? So the big question is this, how do those of us in the real estate industry with crazy amounts of ambition, how do we think bigger than the building of our own empires? How do we simultaneously seek success and significance, income and impact? My name is Justin Stoddard, and this is the Think Bigger Real Estate Show. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Think Bigger Real Estate Show. Very excited to be here. Have with me a subject matter expert. Uh, this gentleman, he was retired by the age of 22 because of how he learned to leverage real estate to create passive income. Uh, not only has he done that, but he's now gone on to be featured on Bigger Pockets podcast as a subject matter expert on the topic of co-living. Uh, Sam Weger, such a pleasure to have you here today. Thanks for reaching out and being a part of the show, my friend. Yeah, man. Super excited to talk with you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Really appreciate it. You know, the, the interesting thing uh, is that not only are you, um, do you kick A when it comes to real estate, but you also do that karate. Tell us just quickly for the folks at home, a little bit of your backstory when it comes to teaching people about karate. Yeah, high level view, man, is um, I was homeschooled and uh, I was undiagnosed ADD, undiagnosed ADHD. And my mom said, you need to be in something that gives you more discipline. You need to be in something that gives you more focus. And so um, she put me in martial arts and I had an awesome opportunity with some amazing instructors that coached me and guided me. And uh, so I started training when I was 12 years old, earned my black belt by the time I was maybe 15 or 16 and actually had the unique opportunity to buy a martial arts school when I was 15 years old, believe it or not. My parents loaned me $15,000 to buy a martial arts school. I, I don't know where their belief in me came from, uh, but they believed in me tremendously. And it was my martial arts instructors too who really had this like uncanny belief. And so that was, that was my first foray into entrepreneurship, man. So yeah, I've trained, I still train to this day. Uh, and, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really a cool thing. Martial arts is one of those things you can do like real estate investing, uh, you can do till the day you die. And so it's a, uh, it's a lifelong journey for me for sure. You know, I guess my question is, so what came first, your passion, it sounds like for martial arts, that's what pulled you through this, this, uh, this challenge of focusing, and I, I would have to yes. imagine that your ability to deeply focus uh, created or at least uh, catapulted you when it came to real estate investing success. Talk to me about some of the principles of martial arts and how that really helps both investors as well as the average real estate agent succeed in today's market. Yeah, man, it's huge. Uh, martial arts, if anybody has ever studied martial arts, you understand this idea that there is it's a principle based thing. It's not about kicking and punching as much as it is about just building your discipline and building your ability to use the word that you just said, focus. I would go further than the word focus, man. I think, you know, here's my, here's my transparent share. I liked martial arts, but I loved business. Like I remember the first day that I ever bought, um, someone came into the studio. It was like this day two that I owned my martial arts studio and they paid in cash for something. And I remember at that time in my business, I was always taught, I was like from a small town and my instructor was, um, he had taught me, you know, you don't, you don't report cash. You just put cash in your pocket. Of course, I don't do that anymore, but that was just what I knew growing up. So I took like the 80 bucks or whatever. He bought a helmet and I put it in my pocket. And I remember being like, this is it. Like it would have to took me eight hours, you know, at that time in my life to earn $80. And I just feel like I had $80. I put cash in my pocket. My point in being like, this turned on for me. Uh, an absolute obsession. And normally when I present on real estate, uh, and I think real estate agents need to understand this too, because like my obsession was how can I retire at a young age? Like that was my 100% my focus, my obsession, and obviously being uh, martial arts, just teaching you to repeat something over and over and over and over and over again. Right. I think it was Bruce Lee who says, like, I don't fear the man who who practices a thousand kicks. I, pract I fear the man who practices uh, you know, uh, one kick a thousand times. And, and that is the principle that martial arts is based on. So obviously I translated what I learned from martial arts into my obsession to like retire early. But I always ask people a question when I start my presentations and I just say, hey, what, what's your version of retirement? 
Like for me, it's, I'm actually sitting in my camper van right now. My wife and I are traveling around the United States. So my, my internet's a little slow. That's why. Cause the AT&T hotspot I put on the top of this thing sucks. Sucks. <laughs> it just sucks sometimes. But my point in saying that is, um, yeah, like, um, having that obsession, like it was a healthy obsession for me. How can I, what, what my version of retirement is this, but I always, I always ask uh, agents and people who want to retire with real estate, hey, what's your version of retirement? Because if you can get connected to that, or if real estate agents that are working with investors can get connected, can get them connected to their real reason why, um, then, uh, then you've got the motivation to really, really push through. And that was where my motivation came from, man. It was a roundabout way of answering your question. Hope that answered your question. Yeah, no, it was great. It was, it was a great answer. It really helps. I think in a world that is uh, just so packed with, with distractions, right? Um, I was to say that that the biggest the biggest obstacle that all of us have to face is having our brilliance diluted. Is that we spend so much time chasing something for a little bit until we see something else, and then we chase it and so, and, and it and, and then something else. That if we were actually able to focus, almost like a like a magnifying glass focuses the sun, like we yes. could create absolute fire. We could create absolute fire. Yeah. So I'd love to this Am principle I- of arts having such an impact upon you as an investor, right? And I think everybody listening here today can take that away to say okay, what are some of the things that I need to cut out, the stuff that I'm chasing that isn't wow. working, that doesn't serve me, that doesn't serve my, whether it be my dollar per hour, whether it be the, the ultimate aspirations I have, like I've got yeah. to prune the tree in order to get the most amount of fruit from it. Yeah. And man, on like literally the flip principle of that, but that reinforces what you just said is like, what is, what is working well that you need to double down on? Like, I remember this was like a, this was a concept that, yeah, cause like, just like you said, I feel like as humans, we are, we are attracted to the new shiny object. I know I've been around the real estate space and the real estate agent space to know that it's this or that coaching course or this or the, like, it's always something new. Right. But recognizing like, wait, what am I doing in my life? That's actually producing a result. And why am I not going more all in on that? Like that was a huge moment for me when I was like, I should be doing this and I should be doing this. Like, honestly, we haven't even talked about co-living yet, but co- real estate and co-living like, I remember one day asking myself, like, oh, what, what, like, I could be an inspirational speaker. And, like, I, I'm really inspired by Tony Robbins. Why don't I do more of what he's doing? And then I realized, no, like, martial arts is the thing that's in front of me right now. And it's doing good. Why wouldn't I literally to use, a, like, a, po- a poker analogy? And I play, I play a decent amount of poker. Like, why wouldn't I double down on that thing? Like, wouldn't, why wouldn't I go more all in on that thing? And sometimes you need people around you that can give you the confidence to say, go like do and but that that was that was a huge moment for me in my life too just to play off of what you just said i really enjoy that you know i'm, I'm gonna share here at, at the bottom um i believe strongly that if you're not getting enough business from your warm market that you're missing out right people yeah. already know you they already trust you they already like you there's no yes. reason why you shouldn't be dominating their mind in other words you own mind share to where they think of you more often than they are like now that. And that would lead to more business. And all too often, I think we spend so much time trying to figure out how to court strangers when all we really need to do Mm. is better serve the people that already want to be courted by us. If anybody here is listening to this and they're like, man, that's me. I get it. I've been chasing shiny objects forever. I really want to, I really want to scale my warm market business. Join us inside of the successful real estate agents, Facebook group. That's what we talk about is how to scale a referral based business. So double down, double down. That's a doubling yeah, down move right there, right? Join the group and go, right? I love it. 100%. Yeah. Let's talk about co-living. Sam, I know you've become, again, you've been featured on Bigger Pockets podcast, which is the largest real estate podcast in the world on this topic, right? You're, you're absolutely yeah. somebody who's in the know. What do yeah. what do people at first need to understand about co-living? What is it? They need to, they need to understand that affordable housing is one of the biggest crises we're facing in America right now. <laughs> like, like recognizing, I, I taught, uh, so I presented on co-living uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina uh, last Wednesday and about halfway through my presentation on what co-living is and how we're, how I'm uh, renting homes by the room, which is in essence, what co-living is you're renting homes by the room. And, you know, my little, my little catchphrase that I share with people is I believe in the future in America, a room will be is the new apartment (laughs) like that's what i'm trying to educate people on right like a room is the new apartment if you don't believe me then um as soon as my bigger pockets episode came out i had someone call me from germany and he said sam it's so cute that everybody in america thinks this co-living concept is so new and hip and it's trending and there's all these new up-and-coming venture back companies like we've been doing this in europe 
for tens and tens of years. He goes, I'm actually building co-living buildings to rent by the room from the ground up, like 150 rooms, not apartments, rooms, shared common areas, shared kitchens at a time. And I was like, dude, you're next level. Like that's where I'm trying to get to, right? Uh, so it was a cool little mindset shift because things in Europe are more expensive, right? That they're used to smaller spaces. The shared economy is more popular there, but it's becoming more popular here too. You got Uber, you got Airbnb. When Airbnb first came out, you know what everybody said, you're going to let who stay in your house and they found you on what? And like, they're going to wreck it. They're going to destroy your house. Like that, it just wasn't a thing, right? And it's the same thing with co-living. So at this presentation in Greensboro, about halfway through the presentation, I said, who's getting this? And all the millennials and everybody under like 30 was like, hands up. And I was like, who's not getting this? And like the 60 year olds were like, how did like people are living in rooms, sharing common space with other people. And I'm like, yes, that they are. So um, th that's a, that's an overview of, of what's happening. They're doing it because prices are going up. They're doing it because people want more community. They're doing it because uh, as a company, I can provide safe, I can provide a quiet, and I can provide a clean place uh, for people to live uh, where they pay one fee and all their utilities are included. And I can put nine people in a home um, as long as I can get around zoning regulations and things like that, which there are ways to get around that. But um, I can put nine people in a home and I can triple the revenue, sometimes quadruple the revenue that that home would make versus me renting it out as a single family home. So it's, so it's literally you being a social entrepreneur. You're doing good. You're helping solve a big problem in America by doing, and you're doing well at the same time. So you're doing well by doing good. That's how I meant to say that. You know, and, and again, if, if, if you need further evidence, right, beyond what Sam's telling us here, just look at the numbers, folks. We have uh, inventory shortages. Again, I come out of the home building industry. That is not a quick solution. Right. There is no way to quickly build nearly anything, right? Yeah. It takes time. Yeah. It takes approvals. And some states are much slower than others. So depending upon where you live, That's you right. might realize like it takes a long time to get land approved and start building. That's right. Like it just That's takes right. time. And then you see yeah. the yeah. affordability issues, right? Of, of, of rates going up, things getting more expensive. Then you have a generation of people who aren't getting married as young as previous generations and not having kids, as, as many kids or Beautiful. kids as, as early. And they actually don't attach their identity to assets. They attach them to experiences, right? right. The older generations, like I need a fancy house in the suburbs. I need That's fancy right. cars. Like this newer generation, they're like, why would I want that? I just want to go travel. Right. I want to go see the world. Yeah. And so having this kind of different mentality is, is, is ripe to have a solution like Sam's bringing to us here. It's, it's awesome, man. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's, it's brilliant. Now go back to the number that you said. You can you can triple, if not quadruple, revenue by embracing this new trend. Yes, that's and that's crazy. like the that's like the that's the that's the promise, right? On the flip side of that, there is more uh, there's more management and more expenses involved. Sure. Uh, however, there are a lot of these venture back companies. I mean, there's one called PadSplit. PadSplit's the biggest. They're evaluated their, their last raise, I think, which was like a year ago, they're about, they were evaluated $110 million and they own zero real estate. So it's not like, like $110 million is easy to achieve. If you have a company that owns a bunch of real estate, but $110 million, just because they're trying to be the, the platform, the technology that allows people to rent rooms. And so, um, you know, you see that and what they do is they will help people manage these properties. Right. So, and this is good to know as a real estate agent, because if you're, helping your clients find alternative real estate investments that actually cash flow and not just actually cash flow, but cash flow well, more than likely that you, you know, your clients are going to want companies that can help them manage it. Unless you want to do like me, I'm, I'm to a scale now where I have a team and we manage it and that's great. But um, there's these other companies, there's Alcove, there's a company called Bungalow, there's a company called Live Home Room. These are all, these are all tech startups that are understanding what's happening with the room rental model and are saying, let's be the platform. You know, and Pat Split's the biggest, I think there are 40, 100 rooms. And, and like their goal is millions. Like I just interviewed the CEO, Atticus, on uh, for my course that I teach on how to pe teach people to do co-living and scale their co-living business. And um, he's like, look, we're just like, we're literally out to solve the affordable housing crisis. And in order to do that, we need millions of rooms, millions of rooms would just barely begin to scratch the surface. So they're just getting going. And it's just cool to see these things start off, though. Um, those, are, those are the companies that come to mind. But I think those could be great resources for agents as well, those companies. You know, I think uh, for the for, for the average agent that's listening to this, right? And like, it's nice to be educated. It's nice to be kind of like mentally stimulated here for a few minutes. Be like, oh, that's a cool trend. 
The real yeah. opportunities are what, Sam? When you're looking at the MLS, um, obviously certain jurisdictions are going to be more difficult than others. Uh, but what should people be looking for? If, if you're an agent and you're either looking for new listings, right, where maybe somebody who doesn't think that their property can sell for a certain amount, is there a different valuation or at least a different pitch now that you can make to an investor on why your property is worth what it's worth because of approvals that you've gotten for co-living? Talk to us about, again, being in the shoes of a residential listing agent right now, yeah. looking for more opportunities to list properties. Because if you can do that, you're in great shape moving you know, into this recession and this you know, uh, market retraction. Uh, help us understand like, like what, what would you be looking for if you were a licensed agent right now to really take advantage of this and opportunity? Just just so I'm clear on the question, you're saying, hey, if I was a licensed real estate agent, uh, you know, how how would I how would I find a co-living home, or how would I just be able to pitch that as as an option? Maybe just clarify that question. Just, I want to make sure I'm answering yeah. the right one. Yeah, I would say um, I'd, I'd love to have you answer both. Just what's the biggest opportunity if you're a listing agent in this market? Yes. What would you do? Yeah, I mean, okay, so 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 let's so I'm a full on like this. What I do started off as just house hacking, right? Was the term. And like now it's like, I hate calling it house hacking because it's like, no, I, you know, I have 150 tenants that all pay rent and they're all living in these environments and it's exploding and we have more demand than we could, we have plenty of demand, right? And so, and pad split, same, same challenge, all these other companies, same thing. They're realizing the demand's there. So, so, so I, I think at a very minuscule level, if I was a real estate agent and I'm listing a home, you know, I'm looking for things like large square foot footage homes. I'm looking for things like separate entrances on these homes because that's where people can kind of feel like they almost have an apartment in there. I'm looking for homes that, you know, have uh, the, the, the basement apartment or the basement a um, uh, couple of rooms that people can rent. So at a very minuscule level, if someone's like, hey, uh, affordability is crazy high right now or is, is, is low, I guess, right now then great. Like you need to look for some of these homes that can be easily house hacked where you can rent out a basement, right? Where you have a, a, a room above the garage. And if you can present that to other investors or present that to even home buyers, it, that's the biggest way that I tell people to get started in real estate. Like if someone's like, I need to get into real estate, but I, you know, everything's so high right now. I'm like, great. You buy a house that has a basement with three extra rooms. You can rent out the basement. If it has a little extra kitchen, then that's like a super big bonus. You take the top two floors, you rent out the basement, and, and now you're living for free. And that's how I even stumbled into co-living was just literally kind of hacking homes where I'm living for free, getting paid to live in my homes. And I thought, wait a second, this is something even more official uh, th th than what I could imagine. So I think starting small like that and looking for, I mean, it's the whole, the whole traditional one of like, or you buy a duplex, you rent out half and you live in the other half. Right. And I think if agents can either be looking for those opportunities, be pitching those opportunities to people who uh, maybe are just barely reaching affordability for a new home or at a, at a level that I'm at, you're looking for investors who want to go all in on the model. And I, and I now have investors in my coaching course that are all over the United States that are looking to go all in on this model. They get it. They understand it. And we need agents out there that understand this model, because the truth is like, Obviously, I've got a great agent. I'm in, I'm based in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Asheville, North Carolina. So I can connect them with my agents here. But I got people looking in California. I got people looking. So I'm looking for agents that understand this model, and can then I can pair them with my investors that want to buy. So understanding it is also a good a good move too. And and look, it's not as big as Airbnb, but like this is a trend, and we are at the beginning wave of it. Right? We've started to see Airbnb bookings decline, and in a recession. As we go through a difficult kind of rocky period here, I believe over the next five to 10 years, that's just my personal belief. You might believe something different. I believe that Airbnbs, the kind of the dime a dozen Airbnbs, they're going to start dropping. We're already seeing booking. I own a bunch of Airbnbs, so I know, right? We're tracking all of this. And um, But uh, COVID will increase, right? In a recession, in a difficult time, uh, through COVID, we saw this take off even more. We saw demand increase even more. So um, I think it's something that people need to be educated about. I think they need to understand what a co-living home looks like. Right. And I mentioned some of those criteria. I'm looking for 2,250 square feet or more. I'm looking for at least three full bathrooms. And a lot of times I'll add a fourth bathroom. Right. I'll add because I, 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 people will share a bath in a co living home. So I'm looking for like two people sharing one, sometimes three people sharing one, but that's the max for me personally. Pad split will do four people sharing one, but that's a lot. Right. I'm looking for separate entrances. I'm absolutely hard no on any HOAs because they're actually going to be your biggest ones that are like, you can't do this here. Right. So hard no on HOAs. I'm looking for suburbs. I'm looking for like 30 to 45 minutes outside of the city, but around large major employers. 
right? In, in a perfect world. And I'm looking for areas that just have good, po positive population growth. People ask me all the time, like, can I do it in this town or can I do it in this town? I'm like, yes, anywhere there's a need for housing, which is everywhere just about, unless it's a super crazy rural town in the United States. But I even did this in Asheville. We opened two co-living homes in Asheville. Asheville is a town of 56,000 people, tourist town. Couldn't, we had, we had more, we filled, we had a waiting list for the first home we opened in like two weeks. It was an eight bedroom home. And we had a waiting list because housing is even more expensive in Asheville than it is in the big city of Charlotte because it's rocky and mountainous and like it's just harder to build and things are just more expensive there. So, um, yeah, man, I think, I think agents need to understand it. Agents need to understand what they're looking for. And agents, I think, that want to capture like and want to be on the front end of the trend need to go deeper with it and, and understand how they can um, they can present opportunities to their investor buyers. And I think anybody that's listening here today, go back and listen to what Sam just described as the key criteria that you're looking for. You can talk to your your favorite title company. Um, I'm a fan of Old Republic Title. Uh, I used to work very closely with them. Still do actually from a coaching and consulting standpoint. But I talk to your favorite title person and say, look, here's the criteria that yeah. I would recommend um, or, or, that, or that I'm looking for. And they can pull a list for you, right? And you start having conversations with these yes. people. Um, yes. Like there's just ways to start to get in the conversation. Like those are not difficult metrics to find. Like different criteria or difficult um, criteria to, to find. Criteria. And yeah. I, I, I just think that you can you can really start to expose this really quickly. If you either have investors or you want to go bigger, I would encourage you to reach out, have a conversation with Sam. Sam, this is great stuff. Is there anything else that you want to touch on? I feel like you've just given us um, an incredible starting point here, or a, a great understanding of of the why, the what, and even how to get started. Uh, is there anything else that we may have missed that would be helpful for us, or do you feel like we've covered it all? Look, the, the biggest thing. The biggest thing I think, the biggest question that I get when I start to explain this concept, it really two questions and I'll try to address them real fast. Number one, um, how do you get that many people to live in a home together? And that, and the, and the only, the, the best answer I have for that is um, just having a vetting process for, for putting someone in a new home and making sure that they know what they're getting into, right? And so it's, it's having a good vetting process and having a good set of house rules, right? Which I'm willing to share with people if they reach out and they want to know what my house rules are. I right? just know weapons, headphones after, after. I mean, it's similar rules you might even find in an Airbnb, to be honest, like similar house rules. Once you get past that point, people are like, well, well like, what does the lease look like and how do you manage it? And here's the, here, and then people will tell me all the time, that must be so much more management. But I tell them like, imagine you had an eight, an eight unit apartment building with eight refrigerators, eight washer dryers, eight uh, stoves, eight microwaves, like we're in essence, you have two refrigerators for eight people. You need to have two. <laughs> you have two refrigerators. You have one stove. You have one microwave. And you're putting eight tenants in a home. So in some ways, it's a lot less management. But if you think about a room is an apartment, it's the same thing. You sign a lease for a room. You can evict someone from a room. Everything is the same as if you were just renting apartments. So I think people need to um, people need to just wrap their head around that, that it can be the same. And they need to wrap their head around the fact that it could be less management. And that the biggest pro the biggest challenge, I would say, is just educating people when they're going into this. These are our house rules. This is the type of person we're looking for and making sure that they're a good fit for the home. If you do those things, then you can uh, you can follow through on actually these promises. I was trying to pull up a I was trying to pull up my 14 criteria that I could actually read off real fast. Um, That'd be great. I think the audience would love that. Um, I think everyone's mind's probably blown here a little bit as far as like, man, you think about that in eight unit apartment building, like how long would it take you to get the financing in place for that, right? Versus an oversized property, one property um, that, yeah, you you get the right tenants in there and you have magic, right? You've got literally m more revenue and 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 far less uh, liability, right? Which is, isn't that, the, yeah, it, yeah, isn't that what we're all looking for in anyway? Good investment. So do you over have that? Years, Those... Yeah. Over 12 years, I've crafted 14 things that over 12 years, I've crafted 14 things that I look for in a co-living home. I'll rapid fire them real fast. And we, you know, just, just for people. So number one is square footage, right? 2,250 or more. Really it's the, the, the formula is 1500 square feet is four rooms. And then each, every 250 square feet beyond that is an additional room. So that would mean a 2000 square foot home is six rooms. You could do the math on that. But basically that's just for me looking at thousands of floor plans and I could do this in almost any home. Uh, parking, I, that's something I didn't mention earlier. You have to figure out parking. If your parking situation is bad, then uh, you're going to get complaints. It's going to be an issue, but you have to figure out, okay, where are these people going to park? Even if you have to be an engineer and draw it out and hopefully there's street parking available. I look for bathrooms, three full bathrooms is best. I, I looked at the home as decently updated. It doesn't need to be a level like 
super nice finishes, but it needs to be a level that I don't have to go in and fully rehab, right? Um, no, no HOA or voluntary HOA. Every one of my co-living homes and how I teach the model has to have a community area. So you've got to have an area where you can have desks and you can't turn every piece of square footage into a bedroom is what I'm trying to say. Uh, urban areas, I'm looking with 30 minutes of working areas, 50,000 people or more within three miles, multiple entrances, a floor plan that could be easily split up without changing the whole structure. Like a big open concept home, probably not going to be the best for this, right? Uh, because it's gonna, you're going to have to split it up into rooms that are going to make it really odd and weird. But the homes that sit on the market a little bit longer, the ones that are a little odd and weird already because they're not that open concept that's really in right now, great. Those make perfect homes for co-living. Obviously, HAC newer, Bonus if it's updated, townhomes and condos are okay. I always think about remaking it into a single family house. So I don't do anything that's crazy, like stick a bathroom in the middle of the dining room. Like you just don't do that, right? You, you make it coherent as if it was a single family house. And then uh, actually that's all. <laughs> and then make sure the numbers work. Like really evaluate the numbers well. <laughs> Man, I love it. So much value really that you've given to all of us here, Sam. Um, I want to have brother. you answer one more question just because I think your mindset around growth and possibility is infectious. And I think we all want to be infected by it. So let's talk to you really quickly. Um, one last question, yep. which is this, what does Sam Weigert do to continue to be a big thinker? What do you do to continue to expand your possibilities, thinking bigger than you have before? What does that look like for you? Hang out with guys like you, brother. <laughs> I mean, that's my, that's my answer, right? Like, I mean, I say that, but like yeah. hang out with people who are thinking bigger. That's, that, that, that's, yeah. I, I'm an introvert straight up. My wife would say like, I would go off and I would spend all my time alone, believe it or not. I'll spend all my time alone or the majority of if, if I could, but it's funny because every time I'm also around another big thinker, whether it's on your podcast or it's hanging out in a group or in person or joining a coaching program or joining the Facebook group you, you shared earlier, like that's where all my ideas come from. Like all my ideas, like if I really track them back to where they came from, it was like something somebody said or something you asked me on this podcast or just things like that, man. I mean, that's, it's a simple answer, but that's just the truthful answer. Like get, get out, get, get around somewhere. Um, one of my mentors just says, go around somewhere where it's better. Like if you get around someplace where things are better, people are making more money, they have better relationships. They have, you do that. You can't help, but be like, or better golf. They're just better at golf. Right? Like you're like, okay, what is he doing? Like, you just can't help but be affected by that. I love it, man. It's so, so simplified, right? Which I think oftentimes we try and complicate things. It really is. Yeah. Go find a better <laughs> situation and spend time there. <clears throat> Lastly, Sam, how do people get in contact with you? If they're, if they're like, you know what? I got to learn more about this. I heard you mention a course. How do people stay in contact with you? Even get access to that to really take advantage of this of this new trend. Yeah, man. I would say I would say the biggest way right now for people to get in contact with me would be to go to scaleyourrealestate.com, and then um, if you you can see some of the work that I do, you can be on my email list, and and I, I try to stay in touch. But but all the other social media platforms too. Sam Weigert on Instagram, Sam Weigert on Facebook. Are probably my two biggest right now. Sam Weigert on TikTok. Love it, man. Good stuff. Great stuff. I want to thank you so much, Sam, for being with us, helping us really understand this new concept, seeing the world in a different way, seeing Thanks, opportunities that, that, that we hadn't really fathomed before, right? Helping us to really yeah. think bigger. That's the essence and mission of this show. So I want to thank you so much for helping us do that today. And for everybody listening here today, I want to thank you for joining in, for tuning in, for giving us uh, your time and attention. It means a lot to us. We hope that we have inspired you to do that. If so, please give us a review. We're grateful for you. And uh, Sam, appreciate it, my friend. Looking forward to staying in contact. Dude, for sure. Keep up all the great work. Peace. If you enjoyed this episode, then I have a very special invitation for you. I have created a private Facebook community called Successful Real Estate Agents, where the focus is going beyond success, having both a successful business and a significant life. If you're not yet a member, go sign up.